Oh, February. What can I say how much I love February? It's one of the quieter months. I love winter. I'm a huge fan of snow. Just so much to love about this month, especially being on a farm and particularly a sheep farm. There's really no deadlines in February. There's no big decisions I have to make. You know, like April, I've got lambing and shearing. In October, I have to figure out the breeding groups and get them set up by a certain date. And, you know, there's always, every month, there's some sort of pressure to do something. And in February, I really get to sort of recover from the holidays and sort of do all those things that I've been wanting to do that I can't get to normally because I've just got so many so many you know routine things that need to get taken care of so I thought what I would do is just tell you about why I appreciate February so much and um, don't get me started on March because <laughs> March is even more relaxed but um, yeah there's just it's a great time of year just not having any stress being able to really enjoy the sheep and you know really what what are they doing right now they're incubating lambs i can't there's nothing i can do there and they're finishing off that last little bit of their fleeces before i harvest those in april it's pretty pretty uh pretty quiet here on the farm having said that there are some things i can talk about and share with you so we'll go through some updates on projects show you some of the stuff i'm working on in the wool cave and just update you on the sheep for those of you that aren't familiar with the channel, my name is Jennifer Johnson. My husband and I raise a beautiful flock of soft Shetland sheep right here on our farm in Western New York. On this channel, you'll find videos about raising sheep, using their wool to make things, and just farm living. So first, let's, we can talk a little bit about the wool cave. So. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I have kind of took a break, a hiatus from doing wool projects, but I'm back at that. So I just finished spinning yarn from a ewe that I sold, but I bought her fleece back. So I do this where possible, usually local farms. If I sell them sheep, but they're not into wool. So for example, this person I'm talking about right now, she, her son shows our sheep in the 4-H fairs but they don't use the wool. So I buy the wool back from her and she's very generous because she does coat them knowing that I like cleaner fleeces and she uses my shearer, so they're sheared expertly. So, and I decided to process and spin this particular used fleece and I can't remember why. I think maybe I just wanted to have, you know, a nice fleece for myself to enjoy. And um, so this was Sigrun is her name. She's a gorgeous black ewe and um, enjoyed spinning her. I got three beautiful skeins of yarn from her and I flicked it with my flicker and then spun up from the lock. So that's how that yarn was made. The other wool I'm working on is from a U. Actually, I sold the same U. I sold this U Blue Sapphire to that same person, same girl. So I got her fleece back and Blue Sapphire is a gray cat mugget, but she's spotted. So she actually is like mostly a silvery white color. And then she'll have like charcoal -y spot. I don't know why I'm, <laughs> she has like charcoal spots all over her body and she's really striking. So I got her fleece back. Now last year I broke it up into one ounce packets because it was really coiled really tightly. This year it doesn't seem like it's coiled as much. So I'm enjoying flicking her fleece. And she's, I think she must have sheared inconsistently because she's got certain parts of her fleece are fairly short and others are a nice, you know, two to three inch staple. Four inches if you stretch them out. So I'm, I'm flicking her wool and then I'm sorting it. So if it's on the longer side, I may end up turning that into bats or I might spin it myself. We'll see where that ends up. But the shorter locks, I'm flicking those and then I'm putting them on my drum carter very slowly and on a very narrow band because there's not a whole lot of it. And then I'm dizzing that off. It's, it's 
pretty much like comb top because it's all the fibers are all aligned and I'm getting a nice worsted spin from that. So I've got one skein already made and I'm working on a second skein. So I'm really enjoying working on her fleece. As I get to the darker bits, I'm gonna have to decide what I'm gonna do there. I don't know how much fiber I'm gonna end up with. I do have to make one small skein of the lock spun, curly locks, that bumbly yarn that I make because I have a client who bought a skein of it to make a hat and she lost <laughs> her game of yarn chicken. So I told her, it was my pattern and she used the correct needles and everything. It just, there wasn't enough fiber. So, so I'm gonna make her, I don't know, maybe 20 yards of this bumbly yarn. So I'm trying to put together some of the curly locks and set those aside. If I'm not able to get enough, then I'll have to wait until shearing because there's no, there's no wool out there in the garage right now. I think I might have a couple very straight black ones, but nothing that I could make a bumbly yarn with. So that's what I'm working on. It's a lot of sorting and stuff, but you know, whatever. I like it. I'm touching their wool and enjoying them, thinking about them. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about is um, this Sunday, February 19th, 2023, is a fiber festival. So there's an event. It's in Rochester. Um, it's about an hour's drive east for me. On a pretty, It's a pretty straight, it's called the Thruway. Very straight, you know, highway that I can take to get to this festival. It's in a hotel ballroom. And the woman that runs it, her name is Tina Turner. <laughs> really, it is. It's her name. And she, um, she's got a little shop, then she does knitting classes and lessons. And so she puts this on. And it's a nice little event. So I'm looking forward to that. So that's Sunday, I don't know, 10 to 4. I'm going to share with you some footage from that event last year. I went around with my GoPro to the different booths and stuff. So, and then I'll put a link to the entire video if you want to see it in the notes of this video. But, so that's the first, that's the first fiber festival for 2023 that I'll be doing. I have another one coming up in May, which is another one day local event, a quick, you know, pop up. And then I did one in June last year. I don't think I'm gonna do it again this year. It's a two day event. It's, I have to get a hotel um, it's really nice. I really enjoyed it, but it's just a lot, especially if I'm doing the one in May and then to do one in June because it's a lot of work and to be away from the farm for that much time. I don't know. I'm kind of back and forthing on that one. And then in October is my local Western New York. That's kind of my home show. That's the one I've been doing for years and years. This, I think it might have been the first festival I ever did. It was called something different back when I did it originally. But So I have that one, and then in October is Rhinebeck. And I'm looking at investigating a festival that one of my, um, one of the subscribers to this channel, and just a good friend, she said, you know, she invited me to um, have a booth there. It's in the Adirondacks. And if those of you that are familiar with northern New York, I think everybody thinks about New York as New York City, but boy, northern New York and those hilly regions are just beautiful. So I'm very tempted thinking about that one still. It's, that'll be three festivals in the fall. So. So, that's, so that's that. So that's going on Sunday. So I got to get ready for that. And I just got a, a request to bring um, the, the drum card or the Magicraft drum card or to the guild meeting, which is Saturday. And I hadn't planned on going because of the festival and I wanted to get ready for it. But somebody asked me to bring my drum carter to the meeting for her to try. So, of course, I'm <laughs> really excited to oblige. So I'll be doing that on Saturday. I think what I might do is set up a table and put the carter there and then all the other fiber preparation tools from Magicraft that I carry and just sort of, you know, offer to demonstrate or let people try stuff. So that's going on. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about chores. 
what it's like right now feeding the animals. You know, through the year, it's always a little bit different. Right now, I'm giving the ewes, all the females that live in the barn, I'm giving them one bale of hay in the morning and then a bale of hay mm. in the evening. Right now, I'm pulling the hay out of our loft, which is that little space above the center section of our barn where we've got hay stored up there. I've got a couple piles of hay from last year that I'm gonna use for the ewes, and then I've got a little bit older hay. It's still good, but just it's not as good as what I give the ewes, so I'm using that on the rands. My goal is to get all the hay out of that loft because we are getting a delivery at some point, I don't really know when, of um, 200 more bales that our hay supplier has been storing for us on a wagon. So that wagon should be here. We'll be doing hay in the winter, which is kind of strange for us. Normally we do it, which is awful. We do it in August and it's so hot and ugh, I hate it, unbearable. So this will be kind of a nice change to do hay in the winter month. But again, like I said, I have no idea when I'm getting it, but I want to get that loft cleared out because we'll put about 100 bales up there and then we'll put 100 bales in the barn. Depending on what the weather is like determines where I'm going to feed them. So if the ground is nice and hard and frozen, I'll feed them outside. If it's smushy and wet, which we've been having very unseasonably warm weather and a lot of rain, so the ground is kind of squishy and wet right now. I don't like to put the hay down. I put hay right on the ground for feeding them. And um, if you put it on the wet ground, that bottom layer of hay gets soaked and they won't eat it. So that whole section of the bale gets wasted. So I'll feed them inside. So it just depends whether it's, you know, the weather, whether they get fed inside or outside. <laughs> This is my greeting every morning. Everybody comes up to say hello and hopes to get a chin scratch. And then there's those that are a little less interested in me. When the gate's not chained, there's two ewes that have figured out that if they get in that lobby, there's a bunch of hay they can eat. And funny, it's only the two that go in there. Everybody else hangs back. This day the ground was frozen enough that it made sense, even though there's like a muddy patch there. But it was frozen enough to let them eat outside. It's good for them to be outside, it's healthy. And then I will refresh the water buckets. So with the water, yeah, I'm refreshing the water buckets. Right now I've got three heated buckets in the barn and three that are standalone. And it's just about, I've got hooks for water buckets in spaces that don't have easy access to an outlet. So the most of the time they're fine. But the few days where we've gone below 30, you know, the, when the water freezes, the buckets that are heated are enough to keep them in water. I've started graining all the ewes just because we wanted to make sure the bread ewes get the grain that they need so that we've picked that back up again. I'm doing everybody so there's 10 or 12 trays and I'm putting roughly six cups per tray so that's about one cup per ewe although I know some of them are getting a little bit more than their fair share um, and I only do that once a day. I do that at night. We took fiber samples last weekend was that um, and this is where you know each you gets handled and we'll take a small piece of fiber I'll talk about it in a second here that we'll send to the labs to get tested for average fiber diameter which is one indicator for fineness that we use 
anyway, when we did that, checked all the bread used, and they all are in very good condition. A couple of them might be a little bit over <laughs> overweight, but it's okay. They're they're not. It's not terrible. So that's really good. They look great. So it doesn't take them very long to finish those 12 pans of grain. For whatever reason, one is not good enough, they always have to check out another one. Never really understood that. So once they're done with the grain, I kick them out of the barn. They totally know the drill. Lock them out. And then I need to pick up all the grain pans and put them on the stairs that lead up to the loft. Get them out of the way. If I leave them out, they just get poop and dirt in them, so I put them up on those stairs. Then it's time for hay. So this is the evening feed, so they get another bale. Top off all the water. And then I just split up the hay across the three sections of the barn, put a little flake under the stairs for the little babies. I put the hay in the exact same spot every night because they know they, it matters to them. So just watch what happens. I've got three or four little lammies that'll go in between me and the wall. Some stragglers, there they are. <laughs> they like that corner bale for some reason, that corner spot. And then they'll work on the hay. It takes them a couple hours to get, get it all eaten. And that's their feed for the night. So then well, the other thing I do chores wise right now, I've got three ram pens. So each one has their own heated water bucket and I'll give them each their allotted amount. There's two ram lambs in a separate pen. They get a small flake. I got three adults in another pen. They get a slightly larger flake. And then I got the four yearlings out in the brown shelter. Um, and I have to keep them all separated. And, you know, one of these days I'll do a video on managing rams, but rams are very, um, you know, they've got <laughs> these tendencies because of the testosterone and their hormones where they... They're on the spectrum, I guess. Some rams can be very chill, like hairy or white ram is very gentle. In fact, he's an adult ram, but I have him in with the yearlings because the adults were ripping him to pieces. But then, you know, you can go from a very gentle ram to a ram who's very aggressive and that there is a spectrum there, but even the gentle ones every so often, you know, they can turn and it actually does depend also on what their community is. So like if Harry is in with two ram lambs, he might turn into something totally different. It's really bizarre. Anyways, we've got them in three separate pens because there's three separate sizes. You know, a Shetland takes three years to get to their full growth. And it's just a really bad idea to put like a smaller ram, younger ram in with an adult because the younger rams don't know to back off, you know, and we've lost a lot of young rams. So we just decided to you know, put them in the separate pens and deal with it. It's three buckets of water that I have to schlep out there and and whatever. But um, it's just a better, you know, it's a lot less dangerous. So, so that's what we do. So that's the other piece of it. And check to make sure the mineral feeder is full because they have to have minerals as a supplement to their diet. Just, you know, just to help them with um, metabolizing and you know, help to fend off illness. So that's the animals taken care of for the night. Turn off the lights and say good night. Trying to get more videos out on the channel, but um, I'm trying to learn new stuff and I've got some new pieces of equipment, so it's taking me a little bit longer. 
and I'm trying new formats and stuff. But um, I do want to do, I do have a plan to do a video on the AIUs that we did and really kind of just narrow focus in on those nine U's, you know, why we selected them, what we like about them, what our expectations and goals and hopes and dreams are. So, so that will be coming. And I also want to do, hopefully in the next two months, I'm going to do a video on the Magicraft Fusion Engine Drum Carter series. So I've done a whole bunch of playlists on the spinning wheels, and I haven't done the carters yet, only mainly because I wasn't able to keep them in inventory, but I have a good set of inventory now, a good assortment of the different um, carding cloth densities. So um, it's time to do that, so I'm looking forward to doing that. I also have a couple interviews where people have said, yep, we'll do it, but I've had a hard time getting the Zooms set up and stuff. So, so there are some plans out there for that. I'm shipping really regularly. I mean, the Magicraft orders and wool orders. I do a lot of stuff, if you didn't know this, I do a lot of selling online products from the sheep as well as from my Magicraft dealership. So that's been really steady. Pretty much every day I'm packing up and I, I reuse material. So the packing can kind of take me a little while because I don't have anything standardized. So it's like, you know, find the right box, figure out what I want to wrap it in and you know i'll use you know <laughs> after the holidays people were getting stuff wrapped in like old christmas paper like wrapping paper because i won't throw it away i put it in the bag and i use it for stuffing or wrapping for protection or whatever um so yeah so pack it up get it processed through the system shipping labels and then i have the um postal service they just come right up to the porch and pick stuff up so fortunately I don't have to drive every day to the post office which is really nice a couple other things I just thought I would talk about every day I have a little checklist of things and I make a note to check my activity diary which is anything that's happening on the farm and um, I we I, you know we got some we collected some data from when we did the fiber samples because we dewormed some of the smaller lambs just to make sure that you know there's nothing holding them up from gaining weight in fact what ha i did check their weights we weighed them this last time and, and went into the activity diary and because i keep every little piece of information in there i was able to see the last time i weighed them all of them have gained at least a pound so that's good um but yeah there's a, there's tons of stuff in there like i just sold a u so i noted in there that you know the day that she left and Anything, just anything, and it's really remarkable how helpful that is. So those of you that are thinking about starting a farm or already have one, keeping this diary has been really helpful. Any little thing, even if I just do somebody's feet or if I rue somebody, you know, putting it in that diary really helps me to, I don't know, I don't have to think as hard, right, because I can just go in there and see what I did when I did it. So for example, I want to start rueing. Now I'm not going to do it in February because it could still get cold. And I was thinking about starting March 15th, but I went back in my diary and remembered that Rich and I talked about it at length and decided that April 1st was when we would start because it's the least risky in terms of a you having all of her wool taken off and then the temperature's going into the single digits because that could still happen in March here. So just an example. The other thing, I got two more things to tell you. The other thing is that um, I was talking with a spinner we were doing a zoom session because she was she wanted me to help her with something about her wheel her magic craft wheel i don't do zooms on other manufacturers but at any rate so we're talking now i can't remember exactly how we get on the subject but she had said she restores vintage clothes and she likes to use linen thread and i said you know it's really interesting that you say that because i've gotten like three inquiries in the last month from people that said, because usually when people reach out to me and talk about wheels, their wheel purchasing, what they want to do, they'll tell me what they're doing. And like quite a few have been saying that they are, they want to spin flax. They want to make linen yarn, linen thread. So I was like, what's up with that? And she said, well, probably linen thread has been become all of a sudden really hard to find. And when you do find it, I guess it's extremely expensive. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Well, I ended up doing a Zoom session with the folks at Magicraft a couple days after that and happened to mention it because this person I was talking with, the, Magic, the customer, said, you know, is there a particular wheel you think that does better with it, with flax? I'm like, I have no idea. I've never spun it before. 
So when I was on the Zoom call with MagicCraft, I asked them, you know, you guys here. And they weren't 100% confident. So I went out and I bought flax. So I've got two, they had two products and I bought both of them. One of them is called Top, which is, it seems softer and finer and a little bit, it does not, it doesn't seem as much like a plant-based material. And then I bought this other thing because I had two options. So I bought them both. And the other one is called Strick, Flax Strick Braided, four ounces. I have no idea what that means. So what I'm gonna do is research what that means, what these <laughs> words mean, and how you spin it. You know, am I supposed to just line up all the fibers? Or am I supposed to do something with it? I don't have any idea. So I'm all of a sudden interested in that. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> really, I probably won't do this. But I'm thinking about maybe growing some flax here on the property and trying that out. So the top, I ended up getting it from the Woolery. The top was $22.00. And the flax strick was $26. I don't really know what the weight is on this. I don't know. Hey, correcting cat. What does that say? She's the correcting cat. She tells us this and that. Sometimes she wears a hat. She's the correcting cat. It's 250 grams. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'd like to introduce a new addition to my videos, and that is the correcting cat, which is actually Trixie, but I don't know. <laughs> she's hilarious, and she's such a know-it-all, so I figured I'd take advantage of it. All right, so I'm going to mess around with that. Kind of looking forward to that, and um, i got to do some research. Probably we'll get on YouTube, and, you know, very confident that I've got people watching this video right now that are going to chime in and help me find good resources on what I'm supposed to do with this fiber. And if not, that's fine too, but I know how you guys are. Um, and then the last thing I want to just tell you about is I've got to sit down. I've got all those fiber samples. So when we collect them, we put them in the bag and then so I bark Stephana. out the number of the ear tag usually. Many times I'll say who it is, the name of the U, but most often it's the ear tag because it's a safer, you know, more cleaner way to do the data. So then Rich wrote the number on the bag. So now what I have to do is go through them all, put the year on the bag, which is important because I like to know from year to year how their fleeces develop and change. And I usually, if I've got the ear tag, I'll put her name on the bag just so it's easier for me when I want to go file them because I'll file those. When I send the samples to the lab, we use Texas A&M. I give them a little bit of extra money for shipping and ask them to return any unused fiber back to me. And um, I'm pretty, I got to check because I just read somewhere that their form has changed, the application for submitting samples. So I don't know if maybe they're not doing that any longer, but when I get them back with my samples, like a month from now, I'll take each of those samples and I'll put them in the use folder. And like I said, then I'll have them to compare. And um, even like if, I wanna, if I'm looking at her data six months from now, and I say, really? And so then I'll go pull out the sample and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I guess. So I've got to mark all those bags. And then I have to pack that up and ship that out to Texas A&M with a check. Usually they, they raise their prices every so often. I think the last time I did it, it was $7.50 a sample. And I have, what do they say? I have 70 sheep right now. So going be around 400 bucks. I'm going to do the ram fleeces at shearing. I just don't feel like wrestling with them right now. So I'll wait until shearing, which is April 9th, 2023, Easter Sunday, is when our shearer is available. So we'll be doing shearing on many of the ewes. Some of the ewes I'm going to rue, but like I said, I'm not going to start doing that until April. So. so that's what's going on in this lovely, cold, slow month, which... You know, the temperatures make your, instinctively make you want to just sit in the house and wrap up in a blanket and knit something <laughs> or read a book, which I just love that. So, 
So yeah, so that's what's going on here in February. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for sticking through here to the end. And I hope you can come back again soon.